Until now, the section has focused on problems, timing anomalies, and exceptions or errors. That doesn't give us a complete set of requirements, but here's a simple classification technique for requirements that augments the presented DFD analysis techniques. It helps you get a more complete set of user stories, features, functions, or requirements by any name. So to answer the question of how to get from those workflow analysis results to requirements or user stories, uh, we really need to exactly establish what those requirements or user stories define. You'll find there are basically two categories of requirements. The change requirements define how the future system will do something very different from how it's done today. The stay the same requirements tells the developer that there's a benefit to preserving what is currently done well. For example, if you're designing a new cell phone uh, which you can control with your thoughts alone, you still need to affirm that it needs to be able to place a phone call. What seems obvious to a domain expert is not necessarily so to the developer mind. So when you're writing user stories or requirements that define a future solution, you can focus first on what will be different in the future. Workflow improvements occur by either doing something you're not currently doing, or eliminating doing something that you are currently doing that's no longer needed. Those categories of requirements tend to come naturally because they're both situations that you're describing changes to the existing workflow. In order to know what things should change, you need to determine things that are causing you problems. The three analysis techniques we presented in the prior lectures are all designed to uncover situations that are not desirable, but also not always obvious. Fixing those situations requires changes to the existing situation. The most common type of change that people think about are the things that they want, but don't currently have. We humans can be greedy, and we often think life would be better if we only had this other thing. For example, the domain experts might find the sort mail function to be the most boring part of their job. They might say something like, we need a fully automated mail opening and sorting machine so we can start processing orders quicker. It's not clear whether that requirement is good, bad, or indifferent, because that would require further analysis. The acquire category typically contains 80% of IT requirements, and they are the easiest to elicit from stakeholders. Since most people tell us what they want to acquire, we will not waste your time talking about this type of a requirement in more detail. Suffice it to say that the visualization that the DFD provides will guide your stakeholders to discover needs in this category. Once you and your domain experts can visualize the workflow and issues, i.e. problems, timing anomalies, or uh, internal external exceptions, the next step is to capture requirements or user stories defining changes to the workflow that abolish undesirable situations. The easiest way to eliminate issues is to focus on the cause. If the situation is complex because there are multiple places it could be caused, you may need to do root cause analysis. Once you have narrowed the causes down as much as possible, here is a logical approach for deciding how to change the workflow to eliminate each undesirable situation, whether it's a problem, a timing anomaly, or ineffective error and exception handling. First, try to find a way to prevent the problem from happening. You will need to add or change processes, flows, and or data stores that precede where the problem's observed. Your requirements specify how to recognize the situation and handle it before it becomes a problem. If you can't figure out how to prevent it, write a requirement for how you can correct it when it happens. This implies changes inside the process where the problem is observed. Now, ideally, that process should automatically detect the problem situation and normalize it. So corrective requirements are reflected in the detailed description of the impacted process. If you can't figure out how to prevent or correct the problem, as a last resort, how can you recover from it when it happens? On a DFD, 
at the appropriate level of detail, recovering means adding data flows from the process in which the situation is recognized to a new process that undoes changes already carried out, then adjust the situation to normalize. That's, by the way, often a manual intervention. Finally, you'll add a data flow going back to wherever you can pick up the processing again. This solution adds complexity to that receiving process because it now has to integrate the new flow into its normal processing sequence. Finally, if the sole cause of the problem is in an external entity, it's a political problem that needs to uh, involve management. Just keep in mind that the three possible ways to change workflow, prevent the undesirable situation if you can, correct it if you can't, and recover only as a last resort. That recover option has too high of a probability of introducing additional errors into a complex data flow. Once you've addressed what should change to solve your problems, you don't want to neglect what should not change. Requirement types that are all too often overlooked are things we have now and want to keep. An example of a requirement affirming what we currently have and want to keep might be, all checks received in the mail will be forwarded to accounting as soon as possible to allow accounts receivable to process bank deposits the same day we receive the check. All too often we get the general requirement, I want everything to stay the way it is now, but I want the problems I have to go away. That general requirement is an oxymoron, because as we have seen, your current workflow is the reason for your current problems. If you walk the domain expert through the diagram and ask for each item, is there anything about this process or, or data flow or, or data store that should not change? You're a lot more likely to get concrete, actionable requirements. Another class of requirements that are often overlooked are those defining things we want to avoid. These describe functions or features or requirements that you don't currently have, and you want to make sure that the new solution does not force you into getting it. An example of uh, a requirement defining something to avoid could be uh, as a credit validator, I can check a customer's credit status without involving external credit bureaus. Both of these scenarios describe conditions that are true now and should remain so when your digital solution is in use. Since requirements in these classes describe the status quo, they are often assumed. And as a veteran of too many change initiatives to count, I can confirm that assumptions lead to failed products. Now, although this simple framework stands on its own and really doesn't in any way, shape, or form depend on a data flow diagram, the DFD overlay techniques presented earlier facilitate the discovery of requirements in all four categories. And as a final check, I recommend reviewing all documented requirements. If you see a requirement that expresses something you want to acquire, well, check with the domain experts if there's anything else that they want to affirm, abolish, or avoid while they are acquiring that. If you read a requirement defining what you want to avoid, is there anything they want to affirm, abolish, or acquire related to that requirement? This simple concept is really a reality check. If you internalize it as your way of thinking, it will help you minimize missing and misunderstood requirements, and that will drastically increase the odds that IT delivers a digital solution your business community needs and deserves.